Hello, this is a short version of a, a short version of a talk I gave some time ago on silence. It's just an extract from it, a shorter version. And I thought for some reason I'd, something told me I had to do this at this particular time. Silence is a concept that we use to describe something that is beyond the range of perception of our six senses, sight, sound, taste, touch and smell, and the lower mind and our emotions. It is a return into our natural state, a natural state of being, which we feverishly try to shut out by talking, thinking, reading and many other practices that do not bring us into the silence. Works like the Bhagavad Gita, and Ashtavakra Gita speak of transcending the realm of thought and forgetting all that we know with the conditioned mind before we can move on. H.P. Blavatsky also emphasised this in many of her writings. In the study notes compiled by one of her students, Robert Bowen, she says, It is worse than useless going to those whom we imagine to be advanced students, she said and asking them to give us an interpretation of the secret doctrine. They cannot do it. If they try, all they give are cut and dried exoteric renderings, which do not remotely resemble the truth. To accept such interpretations means anchoring ourselves to fixed ideas, whereas truth lies beyond any ideas we can formulate or express. So she's saying that we have to use something beyond the, uh, the the intellectual to truly understand what's in secret doctrine and all spiritual writings, for that matter. So she goes on to say that we should use the ideas given to us as pointers only. And speaking about the attitude of mind to be adopted when following true Gnana Yoga, the yoga of knowledge, spiritual knowledge, she says this mode of thinking is what the Indians call Gnana Yoga. As one progresses in Gnana Yoga, one finds conceptions arising which, though one is conscious of them, one cannot express nor yet formulate into any sort of mental picture. As time goes on, these conceptions will form, form into mental pictures. This is a time to be on guard and refuse to be deluded with the idea that the newfound and wonderful picture must represent reality. It does not. As one works on, one finds the once admired picture growing dull and unsatisfying and finally fading out or being thrown away. This is another danger point because for the moment one is left in a void without any conception to support one. And one may be tempted to revive the cast off picture for want of a better to cling to. The true student will, however, work on unconcerned and presently further formless gleams come, which again in time give rise to a larger and more beautiful picture than the last. But the learner will now know that no picture will ever represent the truth. This last splendid picture will grow dull and fade like the others. And so the process goes on until at last the mind and its pictures are transcended and the learner enters and dwells in the world of no form but of which all forms are narrowed reflections. It is this realm of no form that many mystics enter when they have transcended all the images generated by the mind. Or is the silence they enter a relative one? I think that perhaps both statements are true depending upon the calibre of the mystic. Mysticism, like all else, has many levels from the sectarian mystic attached to some religion or other, to the ones who have transcended attachment to any religion or system of thought. Some mystics have a sporadic entry into the silence and have no control over it. Some have partial control, while others have full control and can enter this state at will. A Kuo Xiang, a 13th century Taoist monk says, what need is there to take any action? Only profound silence, that is all. What need is there to take any action? Only profound silence, that is all. 
So Thomas Merton, uh, the Christian uh, mystic, uh, from his thoughts in solitude, when I speak, it is a demand that others remain silent, so I alone may be heard. When I am silent, I hear my true self and reach my soul. When I am silent, I hear with a curing heart. Silence teaches us to know reality by respecting it where words have defiled it. If our life is poured into, out into useless words, we will never hear anything because we have said everything before we had anything to say. It's very deep. <clears throat> so let's try to see how we can enter this silence and thereby understand a little more. Occasionally, when I'm in the midst of people in a city, I'm aware of this silence. It tells me that there is something beyond the physical noise that surrounds me. So this silence does not rely on quiet in a material sense. It is something much deeper that can be found while surrounded by seeming chaos and drawn on when we are seemingly overwhelmed by noise. Obviously, it is easier to enter this silence when we are in a beautiful, peaceful surroundings, as the physical noise side is almost eliminated. But it is not essential, and the quality of the experience will be greater and more useful if it can be found in the midst of noise. The touch of this silence can bring us dignity and an appreciation of the wonder and the beauty of life beyond the physical chaos, and also insight into the transience of the life of the personal self, and an awareness of the immortality of spirit and the oneness of all things. The Victorian poet Edward Dowson wrote, They are not long the days of wine and roses. Out of a misty dream, our path emerges for a while, then closes within a dream. I think that's a very beautiful words. They are not long the days of wine and roses. Out of a misty dream, our path emerges for a while, then closes within a dream. Dowson was um, a little known poet, but he gave us this um, expression, the days of wine and roses, which is, which is interesting. <clears throat> and one or two other expressions that we, we, we don't know that he, he actually gave us. Seen from a narrowed view, this is quite true. But taking the wider picture, we can see that the path actually never ends, but emerges again from the dream to continue until the realm of dreams is transcended completely, as H.P. Lovatsky says. Another Victorian poet, Matthew Arnold, writes, Yes, while on earth a thousand discords ring, man's fitful uproar mingling with his toil, still do thy sleepless ministers move on, their glorious tasks in silence perfecting, still working, blaming still our vain turmoil, labourers that shall not fail when man is gone. So if we can spend some time in this silence, many things come to light. <clears throat> the silence consecrates our being to what is true, good and beautiful. Because all things are present, present in that silence. We need to calm the mind, as the Master knows to us, as K.H. says. He says, it is upon the serene and placid surface of the unruffled mind that the visions gathered from the invisible find a representation in the visible world. Otherwise, you would vainly seek those visions, those flashes of sudden light, which have already helped to solve so many of the minor problems, and which alone can bring the truth before the eye of the soul. It is with, it is with jealous care that we have to guard our mind plane from all the adverse influences which daily arise in our passage through earth life. End of quote. We need then to come to this state of silence by not attaching ourselves too much to thoughts and images that arise in our daily life. Many things that happen to us do not matter at all in the scale of things. And if we eliminate those, the few things that may have more importance, we will have more energy and clarity of thought to deal with. <clears throat> but we, have, we give a false value to so many things. The personality clamours for attention. It wants to be heard, to be recognised, to assert itself, 
at the expense of others, to complain, to take itself too seriously in this world of illusions. So we need to find that dimension to our being where all that fades into insignificance. And we find ourselves on the shore of a vast ocean of being that fills us with an awe and a wonder at the beauty that we somehow cannot grasp with our day-to-day -day mind, but that fills our hearts from a source somewhere beyond our conditioned understanding, something that gives us the inspiration to go deeper within. Now, there is a teaching that I've come across in almost every tradition, and this is the one that says, we will never truly understand until we forget everything that we have learned. And this is because to enter the silence, all lower mind concepts and constructs have to go. Otherwise, we are not in the silence. We still have sound, no matter how refined, to hold us back. All things that go out into this world, all the teachings that we cherish regarding spirituality, yoga, theosophy, etc., have their birth and death in the realm of concepts. They can't take us on that final step into the silence. We need to take that leap of faith into the infinite. Nor can we ever understand and love our fellow human beings using conceptualized views of what compassion and love are. There's something deeper than all of this, which we can never frame in thoughts or utter in words. A while ago, I was reading a book in my room late at night and I was on the verge of falling asleep when a voice whispered in my ear, silence is any words we utter without making a sound. Silence is any words we utter without making a sound. I thought this very odd. How can you utter it without making a sound? So it became like a Zen cone to me, but in time I began to get some view of what it might mean. Is it not that for someone who has reached that state of silence, but still lives in the world, that the words they utter in that world don't make any sound, in, 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 a, in a sense that even their audible words are rooted in the silence. So that was a short, shortened version of a, a, long, a long talk I gave, just a few extracts from the talk, just the essence, if you like, of, of the talk, which I thought might be easier to grasp because it comes um, a bit shorter and it's sometimes difficult to to grasp things if it's, if it's very wordy. So I hope, thanks for listening anyway, and Om Shanti, 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 peace, peace, peace. Peace on earth and goodwill to all beings. And the way the world is at the moment, we need peace, love and harmony. You know, that, that's just send that out to the world. It can make a big difference, a really massive difference. So thanks all for listening. Namaste to all of you.